Good evening, everyone. You're more than welcome to this time to hear stories of solidarity for International Day against homophobia, transphobia and biphobia. My name's Kieran and I'm the coordinator of the Open Table Network, which is one of six LGBT plus affirming Christian organisations working together to reach our communities through online gatherings. Following the success of Space to Be, a series of worship gatherings in collaboration with Diverse Church, House of Rainbow, One Body, One Faith, Quest and the 223 Network, since May 2020, this month we're hosting a storytelling evening. Inspired by the theme of this year's International Day Against Homophobia, Transphobia and Biphobia, Together Resisting, Supporting, Healing, we're inviting people to tell a true story from their lives on the theme of solidarity. This was one of the key words shared in feedback from Space to Be participants when we met last March. International Day Against Homophobia, Transphobia and Biphobia has been celebrated annually on the 17th of May since 2004. The date was chosen because on that day in 1990, the World Health Organization declassified homosexuality as a mental disorder. International Day Against Homophobia, Transphobia and Biphobia is now celebrated in more than 130 countries, including 37 where LGBT plus sexual acts are illegal. Thousands of initiatives, big and small, are reported throughout the planet. And this event is even being featured on the International Day Against Homophobia, Transphobia and Biphobia website. We've got folk from the UK and Ireland and several other countries here with us tonight. So it's truly an international evening. It's our pleasure to have you here with us. Your presence is a gift to this unique gathered community. As a white cisgender gay male, I'm pleased to say that none of our storytellers tonight look or sound much like me, which is not always the way when LGBT plus people gather. So I'm delighted to hand you over to Jade from Diverse Church, who will take us through our running order tonight. It is such a delight to have you here with us. Thank you so, so much for being here. I'm really excited. And it is so, so delightful um, to be able to say that first of all, we're going to have Helen from House of Rainbow and story is just one of the most beautiful, powerful, incredible gifts and also acts of solidarity that we can have. So thank you so much. And Helen, it is over to you. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much. An all girls secondary school will be the route for Helen. I would often hear my father command with his West Indian authority. I smiled as I carried home the acceptance letter to present to my recently divorced father. He didn't know that sending me to an all girls high school would be my idea of heaven on earth. As long as I can remember, I've been mesmerized by, by the feminine anatomy. At church, I'd stare at the older women we called aunties for the longest time, and I'd notice and I would snap myself out of the long gaze. I also noticed how many times I'd be referred to as a young man due to the depth and the tone of my voice. It would often startle me, but over time, I began to embrace myself in all of my feminine and masculine energy. Study was the furthest thing from my mind when I started my first term in this haven of beautiful women. My father was very, my faith was very important to me. So I was caught between two powerful trails of thought. If I accept myself in my masculine and feminine energy, why do I struggle? to accept my spiritual identity in line with my sexual orientation. Though I battle daily with my convictions, I never mentioned this conundrum to a single soul. Too afraid to hear myself say the words. I chose what I considered to be strength and I internalized the burning passion and condemnation which consumed me for the best part of the next decade. I attempted to 
still the internal battle I faced every day, which gave way to the prison of poor mental health. I felt trapped without a soul to trust with the deepest parts of my truth. I encountered talking therapy, though at first I was very hesitant and full of anxiety about this bold move. It took everything in me to go to my first session. Today, I can say, hand on heart, it is the best move I made in my journey of recovery. I realized if I wanted to be ch see change, I had to be change. Victorious, not victim, became my mantra, my rite of passage. If only I had been brave enough in 2001, as I am now in 2021, I would have been living my God-given purpose, having achieved so much more, even maybe a university degree. Now at 40 years old, after experiencing the full effects of conversion therapy, I finally found my peace to be with the woman I love and have a beautiful relationship with my faith. Everything has turned out to my advantage. The only loss I can't fully overcome is my father, who no longer is an active part of my life. I know what it's like to have tenacity through life circumstances. I now have a tangible relationship with the God of perfect love, who holds me in the palm of his hand, despite the falsehoods I had to endure all those years ago. I've come to understand that everything I've experienced was the making of me. I've been able to forgive all of those who told me I was broken, demon possessed, needed, needed to fast and pray and experience other rituals to rid me of what they called this unrighteous burden. Most importantly, I've forgiven myself for internalizing all those thoughts of weakness when I could have spoken up for myself and been that courageous woman that others say they now see in me. As a biracial woman raised in a single parent household without a mother and now estranged from my father, I've learned to accept my lot. It's given me a fire in my belly about my holistic relationship with my faith and my passion for breaking the chains that so many women still face today. I now understand I have a mission in life to help lift limiting thinking of women who are now where I was all those years ago. Now that I've qualified as an inclusion strategist and a forgiveness practitioner, I put my heart and soul into liberating women today so they don't have to endure the same kind of internal traumas that I did. Thank you. Wow. Oh my goodness, Helen. That is just incredible. Wow. That's so moving, so powerful. I don't know if I was more taken in by the tangible relationship with the God of perfect love or the haven of beautiful women. <laughs> <laughs> that was really incredible. Thank you. Um, if, see all the love in the chat coming to you and at the very end we're going to do a big resounding off mic clap so I can feel everyone already just bursting um, with celebration for you so we're going to really do that at the end but for now just feel the love that's coming to you from the chat and all the reactions well done it's really really good um, it's my pleasure next up to introduce to you Marinda from 223 Network. Really excited to hear from you and it is over to you Marinda. Thank you, thank you. So this is a day when we come together in love and unity for this wonderful occasion. Those were the words of the registrar to our witnesses as my partner and I registered our civil partnership, one of the very first in the country 15 years ago. We'd already been together for 12 years and we've now been in love for 27, but our legal joining represented to us both a fantastic, joyful moment and something historical. For me, solidarity means not just the gathering notionally or virtually or physically 
of people supporting one another, but most of all, love and unity, things that create well-being in family and friends and partners and even strangers. Back in 2006, when civil partnerships became legal for same-sex couples, we felt it was really important to, to make use of it. And we did so in Kent, which was miles from home at the home of dear friends to preserve our anonymity in the local area where my not yet affirming family lived and I still worked in a Catholic school. We were the first tranche of people to sign up for the new partnership. So there was no service or arrangement at that time and no special form of words to resemble a marriage service. For 30 quid, we could have half an hour with a registrar show our identification documents and in front of two witnesses sign up to our lives together. There was of course to be no mention whatsoever of God. This was to be a purely civil partnership, practical and legal and not a blessed one. We racked our brains. For me, a marriage with no blessing was not a proper event at all. For my partner, the registration was important because she wanted to be my next of kin and make sure that nobody could insert themselves into the important decisions in our joint lives. You might call this formalising a solidarity of the mutual respect and support and love in our relationship. And yet we looked at each other and we wondered where would we find the words that we needed to say to make our formal alliance the right kind of promise. At that time, as an unhappy Roman Catholic, I'd been reading the works of the nonconformist priest, Richard Baxter, who died way back in 1691. He wrote about seeking God through learning and through love rather than institution. And it was really resonant for me and helpful because he appealed constantly for unity and solidarity and peace. Being a gay person and being labeled intrinsically disordered had cast me adrift from my church somewhat. And I was looking for a new place to live out my faith in solidarity with others and by others. And his words really spoke to me and I thought they would speak well for me. I asked the register office what we were allowed to say and I was told that for my 30 pounds I was allowed 20 to 30 words. So with the non-religious blessing of my partner I chose some words by the Reverend Baxter that just about avoided the word God. Across the divide, my beloved and I, she, a non-believing Jew, and I, a faithful but questioning Christian, joined ourselves together legally in love and solidarity with words that we handed anxiously to the registrar for approval in the huge and empty chamber in the trading estate at Sittingbourne. She read the words and she smiled and tears sprang into her eyes. You're my first gay partnership, she said. And I am so delighted for you and for us all. I've looked at your choice of words and I think they're perfect. And she handed me back the piece of paper and she smiled a smile of complicity. And in one of the tiniest but most important acts of solidarity I've ever experienced, she winked. When we made our vows, all five of us present cried. We still believe that these words of solidarity written by a long dead clergyman which we chose to honour and order our relationship are important. They're critical to our personal well-being, but just perhaps they hold a little wisdom and solidarity that could benefit us all. And they are. In essential things, unity. In uncertain things, liberty. In all things, love. The last line of which is engraved inside the rings that we exchanged that day. Oh, wow, I really have goosebumps, Miranda. <laughs> that is just beautiful. My goodness, I'm actually like holding back tears. And you know what? Richard Baxter might have had a lot of wise words, but something tells me you do as well and that you're someone that I would really love to spend time with. That was incredible. Thank you. What a story and what a life. Absolutely brilliant. Well done to you. And next up, just before our break, we have the lovely George from Quest. Go take it away, George. 
Hi everybody, uh, it is my pleasure to be here with so many other wonderful speakers. Something had been bothering me for most of my life, but for about a year it was crippling. It's 2016, I'm having a drink with Eliza and Tom, two other trainee teachers I had met only six months earlier. I was about to spill the biggest secret, only I had no idea and was certainly not prepared for what was about to happen. As we decided to head off to bed, words escaped my mouth and feelings escaped my heart, never to be regained. I told Tom that I or I'd always felt like I was supposed to have been born male and not female. My true feelings were out in the open, my first of many coming out conversations. This one was unexpected and it was painful to say the words out loud. Tom hugged me as I sat on the bed crying. I cannot say much um, of what he was saying has stayed with me. He described some of his own struggles as a gay Catholic, how flexible the definition of masculinity could be. Um, and I remember thinking at the time that his story was precious. But what sticks with me most was that feeling of being secure and held by another person. It was my first ever experience of queer Christian solidarity and it helped me to achieve some peace for that evening at least. 12 months prior to this had been particularly difficult because I had lost faith, totally. For my whole life, I had been aware of religion. I was educated at Catholic schools, a student of philosophy, theology and ethics, and a volunteer with Catholic youth ministry organizations. I had assumed I would go on to teach religious education in my old Catholic secondary school, where I was baptized at the age of 16. Whilst working at a retreat center run by priests and brothers, my questions about gender identity came to the forefront. I wanted to be one of them, but I couldn't. And that was exceptionally hard to deal with. Whilst there, I started to question the purpose of my life. Why was I created the way that I was? Why would I be called to something that I could not ever do? It was so horrifically cruel that I could not forgive God for this torturous life I had been given. My faith just seemed to disappear from that instance. I sat in an Easter retreat and felt my entire life and dreams for the future fade into the abyss. I started to cry, left the retreat and got into bed. I never truly believed that you could cry yourself to sleep. Not until I woke up the next morning and tears were still streaming down my face. I was fortunate enough to have fostered an incredible relationship with a priest at the retreat center. I left the retreat center and began teaching, uh, training to teach shortly afterwards, but he always kept in touch with me. We used to meet up regularly. He would be dressed in semi-formal linen, M&S clothes, smart shoes. He was tall, thin and old fashioned, and I was the opposite. I liked to have a wine with a meal. He was less keen. We are very different people with very, very different lives. We're in fact so different that although we both speak the same language, it very often didn't seem as though we did. The barrier was tough to break through. We would often sit in periods of silence and not know how to respond to each other. Not long after I had come out to my friend Tom, I also had to come out to Father Graham via email because I was too scared to say it to his face. I had no idea how he would react. He rang me instantly. I could hardly speak to him, but he made sure I felt okay after I'd shared my news. He said nothing of the church's position. He gave no opinion about what I had said. He just wanted to know if I was all right. Again, I managed to sleep a little easier that night. I eventually went to see him for confession so I could return to mass. He sat me down on a park bench before we began. I was shaking with fear. He put his hand on my shoulder and said, just so you know, the way that you feel about who you are is not a sin. Do not bring that to confession. And once again, a wave of relief passed over me. The time to come out to my mum, dad and twin sister was looming. I discussed the best time to do this with Father Graham. Unfortunately, there was not a best time. I had moved to London to teach and my parents were in my hometown of Leicester. I told Graham that I was going back one day midweek during term time and he looked very puzzled and asked what could possibly so what could be possibly so important that I could take the day off from school. Uh, it was my nan's funeral so um, he said I think it's probably a good idea that you don't come out 
to them then. That might be a little bit too traumatic. Uh, but by the time I got home, the courage had bubbled enough for me to pause the television, tell my parents that I'm experiencing gender identity questions and that I'm, I want to transition from female to male, to tell them that I am transgender. Their reaction was very simple. They said, okay, it wasn't a surprise um, and it, it wouldn't change how much they love me. Despite the simplicity, it was such an overwhelming feeling of support. I couldn't help but embrace them all. And just in case you're wondering, uh, the, the funeral the next day did go without a glitch. Thank you. Oh, George, like so much courage, so much courage. I mean, courage is most profound when we feel fearful, right? Um, I also enjoy wine with a meal, George. Would love to enjoy a wee wine with you at some point. And I think, you know, it's interesting you talking there about that first experience of queer Christian solidarity. And I'm just wondering, I'm sure there are people here for whom this might be the first, if not one of the first experiences of that. And certainly in all the different organizations represented, people will have had their, their first experience of that too. So thanks for relaying that so beautifully, George. Really, really powerful stuff. Okay, yeah. so three incredible, really incredible stories so far. and three more wonderful stories to go really excited about that so next up we are going to have the wonderful gail from the open table network take it away gail solidarity solidarity was a stranger i yearned for connection and unity with others but i attended a church which said it was welcoming, yet I could never truly belong or be accepted there. Mine is a story that begins as one of fear, loss, rejection, isolation and loneliness. I remain single for half of my life to date, believing my sexuality and faith could not coexist. So I chose my faith, living a lonely life of celibacy. However, the thing with stories is that you can always write another chapter and change direction and path. I can't go back and change those chapters of regret, sorrow and pain. I carried them round for many years like a heavy burden, preventing me from moving forward. But you know what? God helped me to let go of the old creased, tear-stained chapters and tentatively write a new chapter called Courage. It begins with an organisation called Courage UK. I contacted them to seek conversion therapy because I truly hated who I was. I was full of shame and guilt and I thought that God was leading me to Courage UK to help me become straight. However, I was wrong. God was bringing courage into my life. Finding this organisation was no coincidence, it was a God incident. God was giving me the courage to accept who I am and to embrace my sexuality. I didn't know that Courage UK had changed their focus as they realized their theology was so wrong. They connected me with someone who then introduced me to Open Table and so my journey to freedom commenced. I was able to slowly unpick all the scriptures that had been consistently used to hurt me and had caused me to loathe myself. I met with Sarah Doyle and this was my first experience of solidarity as she stood with me in my pain and tears. My eyes and my heart were opened and I came to see these scriptures in a new light. I was finally able to say the words, I am gay. I came out to family, friends and colleagues, which was extremely liberating. I felt the chains of oppression loosen inch by inch, leading me to a chapter called Hope. Could it be true that I could walk into a church and be accepted, valued and loved as I am with no conditions, rejection or exclusion? As time went by, I started to believe this was possible and found myself shaking off those chains. Through the gentle warmth of friendship with people of truth and justice, I took steps towards a freedom I had only ever dreamt of. 
When I looked in the mirror, the self-hatred began to fall away, making way for tiny glimmers of love. After 25 years of being on my own, I joined a dating site and found a partner, which was a little scary at first, as distant voices from the past came to haunt me again, making me think I was sinful. But I was stronger now, and I fought and silenced these voices. I took comfort in the words of Isaiah. Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. I held on to the truth that God created and loved me just as I am. I was no longer alone. I came to realise I'm a child of God, a part of God's family, and now able to write a chapter called Solidarity. Open Table brought me into fellowship with Christians from all walks of life, a diverse and beautiful group of people who all loved God. It gave me a safe and secure place to worship with like-minded people, all created and loved by God, celebrating our diversity. Open Table gave me the freedom to be myself and to share with others with no fear of rejection or judgment. The day I first walked with Open Table in a Pride March was the day I could finally be proud of and embrace who I am and turn my back on those who had sought to break me with lies. I cannot be broken now. I have the solidarity of a community of love, truth and justice surrounding me protected and held by God. I may not know what the mystery of tomorrow may bring, but I do know that I do not have to face any more tomorrows on my own. So I can now say, this is me, who for years yearned to be free. Frozen by fear, guilt and shame, my life was incomplete. But with God's help, these feelings I did defeat. I came to see that I could be true to who I so wanted to be. I am no longer alone as me. I am part of a much bigger we, standing against discrimination and oppression, seeking a world of inclusivity, where you can be you and I can be me, together in solidarity. Gail, I cannot thank you enough. Um, oh my goodness, there's just so much power in, in story and in your story. And I mean, I totally love poetry. I mean, it's one of my favourite things ever. I just read it all the time, right? Um, and I love the way you finished with that spoken word there. Um, what a beautiful way that you took us through the chapters. Um, you know, what an encouragement for everybody here and everyone who'll see this afterwards too, Gail who might be feeling some of that exclusion and fear and rejection to know that, you know, there are other chapters um, afoot. And the power of community and human encounter was the game changer, really, wasn't it? Um, and I just feel the need to say to you, Gail, like the church is very, very fortunate that you stuck around, really, you know, um, very, very fortunate indeed. So thank, thank you for you. that. Beautiful. OK, next up we have the wonderful Nicole from 223. I'm so excited. Go ahead, Nicole. Hello, thank you. <laughs> so I'm going to be honest. Uh, I had to look up the word solidarity in the dictionary. And the one thing that stuck out um, in the, in, in, that stuck out for me um, by the definition was union of fellowship. Um, so my story is about where I haven't found a union of fellowship and where I have. So I started going to a new church in late 2019 and I did not last very long there at all. I was only there for five months um, and I wanted to join the worship team there, um, but they made it very clear that they are very anti-homosexuality, um, very, very anti <laughs> Um, that, but they said that they accept you as um, you are, but they just don't agree with it. 
Um, so uh, I told them that I'm bisexual and uh, will this affect me joining the worship team? They said, no, it won't affect that. Um, but as things progressed, it came to a head um, that they wanted to know more about how I felt about homosexuality um, uh, because it might conflict with how strong their views are um, and it could affect me being welcomed into the church. Um, and I wasn't getting any clarification um, with it and time was going on and I wanted to know more about what was going on with it. Um, but it was very clear that my homosexuality was, uh, it had definitely shaken them, um, even though they were saying that it was absolutely fine. And uh, it was very clear that it had just um, blown their minds, basically. It was like, kaboom. Um, so it came to the point where um, they said, we do accept you, but there are conditions. Um, like they said, yeah, it's absolutely fine you being here, but if you were to go out with a woman, Nicole, um, we're going to have to have like the, tr the chat with you. So at the time, um, so at the beginning of the first lockdown, um, I was talking to a woman who I had met on a pen pal app and I really wanted to be with her. Um, but I was really battling with whether homosexuality and Christianity could go together. And this is something that I'd been battling with for about 15 to 20 years. Um, and I'd been praying for about that length of time um, about it with God. And it's something that I'd been saying to God, look, there are things that I can die um, with not knowing. Um, but this is something that I really do need to know. I can't live the rest of my life without knowing how you actually feel about Christianity and homosexuality. Um, so um, that five months um, during the first lockdown um, was a really heavy battle. Um, and I was reading and listening to lots of things from pastors, reading the Bible, uh, the little bits in the Bible to do with homosexuality, which you know, are really not about homosexuality. And I really felt like God um, had finally answered my question on it, finally. Um, so I felt peace about it, even though I still do have those <gasps> moments, like I really freak out about it. Um, and it almost takes my breath away. Um, and it's a really horrible <laughs> feeling when I get it. Um, but I really do feel like God um, has answered my question and I'm not a part <laughs> of that church anymore, as you can imagine. Um, and I told one of the pastors, um, who is the pastor that I really felt like I could really talk to at that church. Um, I told him how I felt about it um, with certain things that were said to me when it came to homosexuality, some really damaging things. Um, there was a lot of tears, uh, a lot of conversations uh, with God at like two, three in the morning, hanging out my window. Um, not literally hanging out my window, but, you know, just <laughs> at my window. Um, but, you know, I got through it. Um, it was very, very hard. So I didn't find um, union and fellowship um, with that church. But I really, I, but I really only found union and fellowship with uh, the LGBT uh, groups um, and the LGBT Bible study group and gathering space group that I found on Facebook, um, which I joined to help also answering, um, to help me with answering that question as well, because it really helps um, being part of these groups, because it just helps constantly give you that clarification as well. Um, and there are also people from other churches where um, I've been in the past uh, that know about me, especially uh, that know about me being with a woman and are really supportive about it, even though they know, um, even though I know, sorry, um, that they don't agree with it. They've seen on my social media that I'm with a woman now um, and she's from Germany, obviously meeting on a pen pal app. Um, and I was there um, for a long time because uh, I, when I went to stay with her, I was actually stuck. <laughs> I got stuck because my flight got cancelled. So I was there for a lot longer than planned in the end um, during lockdown um, over like Christmas time. Um, so, you know, people have 
asked how we're doing and they're happy for me. So that's actually really nice as well. Um, so I guess uh, that there is some union and fellowship, fellowship in that too, even though um, they are part of churches that don't agree with um, homosexuality. But sadly, uh, we do have a very long way to go. Um, but there is a huge amount of, but yeah, there is a huge amount of solidarity still to come. And that is what I am praying for. Um, but you know, I'm 30, I'm still young, and I really hope to be alive to see it um, because it would be amazing um, for us to be able to walk into a church with, you know, your male partner, female partner, um, the many orientations that we are and um, not be told that you can't be here. Um, it would be absolutely amazing and very, very exciting as well. So yeah, that's me. <laughs> oh, Nicole, you're so great. And we really just got such a lovely sense of you there in your story. <laughs> Thank so you. Brilliant, brilliant. Um, and my goodness, I mean, <laughs> like, how boring to be anything other than who you are. Just incredible. <laughs> Amazing. And do you know what, Nicole, if we're all very honest, you weren't the only one that had to look up solidarity in the dictionary. Um, <laughs> Thank you for sharing that with us. And Absolutely. on the note of dictionaries and words, <laughs> it's no coincidence that next up we have Lucy, who is a lover of words, and we're very excited to hear your story, Lucy. Take it away. Thanks, Jude. I've tentatively called this, we are whole. Words are fascinating to me. I can never simply use a word and not be thinking about its meaning, its nuances, how it might be interpreted, misinterpreted, reinterpreted by others around me, where it came from, how it came to be used in its current form. And so whilst any of my youngest pupils at the church school where I teach could probably tell you that solidarity likely came from the word solid, and whilst most of them might be able to even explain what solid means, I predict, predicted that few would actually be able to make a link between the two words. If I'm honest, I struggled to make more than simply tenuous hypotheses. And so since I have my favorite etymology website and a weighty tome of an etymological dictionary and a can't let it go kind of brain, I found out. And I found out that it links to the root word whole. I didn't really think I had anything to offer this storytelling event. I wasn't even sure I understood the concept of solidarity, which I guess explains the mental gymnastics I just mentioned. And I didn't really think of it as a key part of my life. It's not like it was notably or painfully absent, just not at the foreground of my thoughts. I always existed in a privileged space, I suppose, and felt that I hadn't used that space to demonstrate solidarity myself blaming lack of confidence or something. But then again, in the last year and a bit, I've done a lot of work to come out to myself and many people around me. And as I reflected, I realized that examples of solidarity were around me all the time. Subtly sometimes, perhaps. But the impact has never been low key for me. Here I go then, bear with me. It was February 2020 when they interviewed me. The weather was miserable and parking had been a nightmare. I was feverish, coughing, and unable to taste food, but no one was talking about that yet. Life was unknowingly bracing itself for the biggest emergency break the world had seen since my fifth driving test. And yet the planet continued to spin on in blind ignorance, in a sublime kind of not knowing that I've since wished we could return to. I was still awkwardly squashed inside the closet that I had reinforced with steel walls of religious defensiveness, and electrified doors of heteronormativity. I'm sure I was pleased to hear that they'd offered me the job, but it would be a few more days before I was well enough to realize it. Fast forward seven months and it's my first day. My life has since been turned on its head as I'd broken the closet locks, burst out and accepted my sexuality, accepted myself for the first time. Yet I entered nervous, shy, unsure of who I was going to be in this space. After all, my self-acceptance and internal work had happened in an intensely isolated time, 
and I had never been out with people in person before. I walked into the building that would become like my second home, as though I was walking into a stranger's house. Not knowing quite where to put myself, I walked awkwardly around the hall where my colleagues were milling. Desperately turning my head to seek out a familiar face, I saw no one. My boss was late. My departmental colleague, although I didn't know it at the time, was stuck isolating in a foreign country and I was panicking inside. I took a deep breath and sat at a table I had picked at random. I couldn't decide whether I hoped I would melt into the walls and no one would notice me, or that I'd find my next best friend at that very moment. Anyway, that morning I learned that solidarity can be vocal and solidarity can be silent. It turns out that I had sat next to two openly gay members of staff who were talking about their partners and their summer holidays. My internal resources were buffered by this interaction although neither intended in that moment to show solidarity. Later, my line manager and I were talking and he told me that he's one of only a few staff members that wears a rainbow lanyard, but doesn't identify as LGBT+. He said he wanted pupils to know that they could talk to him as an ally and that if only one pupil ever even noticed that that would be more than worthwhile. His vocal solidarity made my choice easy. From that moment on, I was out in my workplace and it didn't seem like a huge thing, but something I could be proud of. Fast forward several months again and reach the present day. Literally the day I'm sitting writing this story, in fact. The colleague who I first sat with back in September is now becoming a friend and is an everyday reminder for me of the importance of solidarity as she supports and promotes diversity in the school population. I'm working hard, of course. My colleague friend comes up behind me and she speaks softly. She asks if I'd like to meet Joy, a year 10 pupil we'd spoken about before, a lesbian teenager from a strict, conservative country, culture and family. My colleague says, I told her about you, Lucy. I told her you were a Christian and LGBT, and she has so much she wants to talk to you about. 20 minutes later, I swear I'm the one leaving the conversation joyfully. Later on that week, several of my pupils in a French class spontaneously used the gender neutral pronoun without prompting. And I wonder if they'll ever really know how much solidarity that silently demonstrated. All because of a simple act of solidarity that I felt in September, I feel like I've been equipped to show more solidarity myself. And yes, I like the full circle that my experience of solidarity has offered me this year. I like that it feels complete. You might even say whole. What a year and what a flipping story. Absolutely amazing. Thank you so much. How wonderful to have teachers like you in schools. Amazing. But in a little minute, you can brace yourselves because we're going to unmute and whoop and clap and get on um, and really encourage the uh, speakers. I'm just wondering before we unmute, if anyone kind of wants to share just a little encouraging comment vocally, for any of the speakers, please take a moment to do that now. Just unmute and go for it. Uh, I just want to say, Lucy, thank you so much for sharing your story. Uh, it's been great having you in diverse church at the same time as me. And um, I still didn't know the half of like what you just said, which was just really inspiring. Like, it's so nice just to have an opportunity to get to know you more and also get to hear all these wonderful people that I wasn't expecting to hear about. So thank you. Thanks, Tim. That was lovely. Anybody else? Yeah, I, I wouldn't mind coming in here. I just wanted to say the last year has been so challenging for all of us. Um, what struck me this evening is how important it is to have the opportunity to share story. It's what we do all the time in our daily lives. You know, we come home and we talk to our friends either or our family and we tell them the story of our day. And in telling a, our story, we make sense of our lives um, and we give other people the opportunity to reflect on our lives, which in turn helps us to make sense of it. And uh, I didn't realise how much I've missed story until this evening. I feel quite tearful um, until this evening. And I have so valued hearing everyone's stories. So thank you. Thank you, Jared. Really, really can relate to that. Story always feels like coming home. 
I can see that G-Day and David both have a hand raised. Um, G-Day, do you want to come in with a comment? Yes, I just want to say what an amazing story to hear. Um, I actually miss Helen's story. I was racing from one program to this one. So, but I want to say thank you to Helen for, for representing the voice of House of Rainbow. But I also want to um, um, say thank you to um, Lucy. Lucy, thanks for your story. It resonates with me. And also George. And, um, and, and I also want to finish by saying thank you to, um, to everyone else. But I want to say thank you to Nicole. And the reason is because, Nicole, you stood your ground without knowing how important that was. Because to be told that you're not welcomed, hopefully, um, in co completely, is absolutely outrageous. I've been where you were before. Um, I, I'm not bisexual, but to be told that you have to leave half of yourself outside of church does, doesn't cut it anymore. Um, and I think everyone is here because we all have a testimony and a conviction that we are who we are by the grace of God. And, and I think if anything is taken away from this storytelling, it is a great testimony in the voices of the storyteller. And I want to say thank you once again uh, to everybody. Thank you. God bless. Thank you, G-Day, and thank you for all the incredible work House of Rainbow are doing. You're an amazing organization. Great, great people. David, would you like to come in with a comment? Yeah, um, I just wanted to say how awesome the stories were, but there's been a little bit in the chat about it almost being a bit prophetic tonight because, like, there's a number of us from Coventry, there's a number of us from Manchester and all over the UK, and, and almost like, a, uh, like that Bible verse that says, one will put 1,000 to flight, but two will put 10,000. As we continue to come together, you know, kind of, may we may we flood wherever we are with that inclusivity. It's been such a blessing for us kind of as a, as a group of LGBT and allies in different pockets coming together. Tonight's just been awesome. I've been really, really blessed. Thank you, David. And yes, I'm seeing a lot of nods and a lot of agreement with that sentiment. I wish we could chat all night. If you feel like you would like to see more of this sort of thing, you know, human encounter and human connection, story and creativity and all of that, can you put a th hold your own thumb up or do a thumbs up reaction or something? I'm just looking at the screen. I'm seeing lots of thumbs up. Well, Kieran, it looks like that's a no brainer. We're good to go again <laughs> with something similar in the future. Okay, it's time. If everyone can unmute and just give a big clap and whoops and cheers for all of our <laughs> 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 okay. Thank you so much to all of our storytellers. You're super, super, super. Thank you very much. And thanks everyone else for being here with us. Um, if there's anything that you felt you really wanted to say and we ran out of time, please feel free to just email the email address that you sent to register and we'll be sure to pass anything on to our storytellers and we'll Kieran and I will hear it as well for future events. Thanks everyone. Thanks to all of the organizations, all the great work you're doing. You're incredible people. Wonderful to share space with you. Go well and go in peace.